When it comes to hating a movie, nothing can beat the pure, unbridled anger of an author scorned. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains in. Today, we're talking about the writers whose work didn't quite live up to their expectations. While many simply choose to not discuss these films critically and just enjoy that sweet, sweet cash flow, others like World War Z author Max Brooks are simply more pragmatic, understanding that the film world tends to do as it pleases, and in the case of his adaptation, it was like watching somebody else's zombie movie. Which, you know, that's nice and all, but we want some tea, sis. Give us anger. Give us hatred. Give us madness. Give us, oh, hey, guy. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is another classic film that most folks agree is a pretty tasty slice of celluloid. Definitely better than whatever Tim Burton was selling. Willy Wonka, Willy Wonka, everybody give a cheer. He's not as clever. However, children's author Ruol Dahl had a different impression of the 1971 film. He thought it was crummy. He hated the music, and he felt Gene Wilder was horribly miscast and far too cheery and fun, which... D did he watch the tunnel scene? Apparently, Dahl preferred a harder-edged British actor like Peter Sellers to take on the role. Come to think of it, maybe he just wanted more of the tunnel scene. There's no knowing where we're rowing, rowing. or which way the river's flowing. Throw out all those cheery, kid-friendly musical numbers, make the candy magnate a cruel taskmaster, and just have him torment children like a chocolatier jigsaw for 90 minutes, and boom, you got yourself a movie. Heck, that's basically the tone we got in The Witches. What, what's that? He didn't like that movie's happy ending? Of course he didn't! That's the rule the way! Speaking of people who have their, uh, very specific ways, Stanley Kubrick always had an interesting relationship with the authors he adapted. Anthony Burgess famously hated A Clockwork Orange, especially the way it just kinda ditches the book's ending, which really ties the whole film together. While 2001 A Space Odyssey utilizes a close, successful partnership with Arthur C. Clarke. However, if there's one writer who was definitively and most famously pissed off by Kubrick's approach, it has to be Stephen King. Heck, we had a whole video last year all about how much Stephen King hates what Kubrick did to his beloved 1977 novel, The Shining. King's problems with Kubrick's take are legion at this point, but his main issue seems to be the character of Jack Torrance, who was inspired by King's own issues with alcoholism and fatherhood. Bourbon on the rocks. In the book, Jack is a well-rounded character who eventually succeeds in turning against the supernatural presence, pushing him toward murder. <laughs> In the movie, well... Here's Johnny! <laughs> yeah, he just kinda goes nuts. When you consider just how close King was to the material and how he's actually kinda right about Jack's lack of a character arc in the film, it's easier to understand his malice toward Kubrick's vision. Of course, most film fans agree that The Shining is a masterpiece of horror filmmaking and is leagues above Mick Garris's more direct 1997 adaptation. I'll be okay. People just like hedge mazes, I guess. If you watched the 2017 Disney flick Saving Mr. Banks, you know a thing or two about how author P.L. Travers felt about Walt's adaptation of her Mary Poppins book series. Not only was she unimpressed by the choice of Julie Andrews to play Mary Poppins, who she felt should be more tart and sharp, rude, plain and vain, she even despised the animated sequences, those damn penguins, and the fact that it was a musical. Now, I don't know if you've seen Mary Poppins recently, but dang, that is a lot of hate. To Walt Disney's credit, though, Travers apparently hated all adaptations of her work, and audiences tend to agree that Mary Poppins is a pretty phenomenal film. M maybe barring Dick Van Dyke's Cockney accent. Just a bit of high spirits, Mary Poppins. Which Travers also hated, so I guess there's some solidarity from all parties on that one. Like many authors on this list, actually like many authors in general, Travers put a lot of herself into her work, and it seems like most of her objections were the result of very close ties to the material. She told one interviewer that Mary Poppins was the story of her life. Her father was a bank manager who lost his job, and through a series of extremely dark circumstances, she found herself taking care of her younger siblings and treating them to wondrous tales, one of which became Mary Poppins. Much like with Stephen King, Travers just wanted this character to be treated as she, the creator, wished. And well, Disney gonna Disney. As I expected, Mary Poppins practically perfect in every way. 
we're going to continue the trend of generally beloved films cast aside by their authors with L.A. Confidential, the neo-noir crime flick starring Kim Basinger, Russell Crowe, Guy Pearce, and, uh, uh, Christopher Plummer's hastily photoshopped in face. It's a gratuity from Hush Hush magazine, you know, buy yourself a new pair of loafers. Director Curtis Hansen, by all accounts, got on really well with author James Elroy, but that didn't stop Elroy from calling the film, quote, as deep as a tortilla. He went on saying the action didn't make any dramatic sense and that he didn't like the bulk of the performances. And somehow, LA Confidential is his favorite of the adaptations of his work. Yikes. Imagine what he has to say about Brian De Palma's version of the Black Dahlia. Still, Elroy was kind enough to pin a warm obituary for Hansen, even if he felt the need to repeat his displeasure in that otherwise loving tribute. Roger Ebert and other critics had a lot of positive things to say about the performances in L.A. Confidential, as well as the labyrinthine plot and how Hansen's film managed to connect all these disparate elements. Perhaps Elroy's right, and the depth of the film is simply carried for audiences by the maze of plot lines and phenomenal cheekbone structure. Or he's just another author who wrote a great book that became a film that's great for different reasons. Ah, here we go. A movie not beloved by just about every film nerd on the planet, I Know What You Did Last Summer, one of the many, many slasher films to pop up in the wake of Scream's success. Jim Gillespie's 1997 film has gained a small following over the years and did well enough upon release to warrant two sequels of, uh, varying quality. The original was co-written by Scream's Kevin Williamson, so you'd think it would be a rock-solid endeavor, but that's not the case. At least if you asked author Lois Duncan, whose 1973 novel the film was loosely based on. As the parent of a murdered daughter, she found the sensationalized violence offensive and called the filmmaker's act of turning her novel into a slasher movie appalling. Of course, critics weren't exactly quick to disagree with Duncan, mostly on account of Williamson's far less intelligent take on the material. Gone were the satirical aspects that gave Scream its bevy of critical acclaim, replaced by some pretty harsh words all around. Gene Siskel called I Know What You Did Last Summer a dreadful mad slasher film that works neither as a thriller nor as a comic commentary on the genre. Yikes. Now all I can think about is Lois Duncan and Gene Siskel dishing on slasher movies in a bar somewhere. Ooh, ooh, and they're smoking cigars, and they're super catty. If you're a fan of the Percy Jackson books, you might have a few bones to pick with its two film adaptations, and you would be joined in your distaste by the series' author, Rick Riordan, who referred to the movies as my life's work going through a meat grinder. But like our next entry on this list, Rick's never actually watched the films, instead forming his extremely negative opinion on the scripts he was given for each film. After all, Rick's a story guy. Critics and fans seem to agree about the films, with not even Pierce Brosnan as an extremely impractical centaur able to lighten their critiques. Tim Roby from the Daily Telegraph called the first installment a slab of market research in search of an actual movie. And when star Logan Lerman voiced his approval of a new Disney Plus version of the story, his fans were quick to praise him and demand he take on the role of Poseidon in the franchise reboot. In between, again, digs at the screenplays. We can only hope that the new writers listen more carefully to Uncle Rick and, you know, give Logan Lerman a, uh, a beard, I guess? A thirsty red-headed daughter? Wait, no, that's King Triton. Ah, crud, I, I, I don't remember anything about these movies. Of course, no list of hate-filled authors would be complete without the one and only Alan Moore, comic book writer behind From Hell, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, V for Vendetta, and Watchmen all of which have been adapted into movies that Moore views with so much disdain that, by all accounts, he's never even bothered watching them, although that didn't stop him from dismissing V for Vendetta as being, quote, turned into a Bush-era parable by people too timid to set a political satire in their own country. Where does all this venom come from? Moore once described the comics industry as, I believe it to be a completely poisonous place. Wait, let me do my best, Alan Moore. I believe it to be a completely poisonous place that isn't really go- I, I'm, a, I'm really bad at this. I believe it to be a completely poisonous place that isn't really going anywhere. That Alan Moore, he's many things, including a filmmaker, a wizard, and a straight-up hater, y'all. It's hard not to appreciate Moore's worldview, though. He lives his truth and refuses to make money from the corrupted Hollywood machine or to even associate with DC Comics, which he's referred to as a rich stalker girlfriend. Instead, he's continued writing on his own terms and has even completed his own feature film, The Show, and it 
definitely looks like an Alan Moore movie. While most humans agree that Akira is one of, if not the greatest anime films of all time, its original creator, Katsuhiro Otomo, was less than enthused during his first screening. He felt the editing and animation got worse in the second half, and was convinced that the film would be a failure. This criticism was due in part to what he felt were overworked animators and not enough time or money to properly present the material. This led to a whole lot of rapid cuts, which tarnished the technical quality of the movie. Now me, I just like the giant blob monster and telekinetic wrinkled kids. Simple man, simple taste. Eventually, Otomo did come around to some degree, and after seeing the film again during its 5.1 surround remix, he came to realize that it was, quote, interesting and maybe not so bad after all. In 2019, Otomo announced a new anime adaptation of Akira, so there's still a chance he'll get exactly the Akira he wanted all along. Either way, it's nice to know that in this case, the writer's hatred softened over time. Clive Barker famously created one of the greatest genre films of all time with Hellraiser, based on his novella The Hellbound Heart. That film, which he also directed, went on to spawn nine sequels, none of which he was involved with after the fourth entry, which yes, did go to space, and yes, it was awesome. It wasn't until the ninth entry that even Clive Barker, who knows a thing or two about bad adaptations of his work, just had to let his frustrations be known on the home of human frustration, Twitter. His tweet was, uh, less than kind. Oh, and those kittens? They're covering no-no words, kids. Hellraiser Revelations, a film so awful it couldn't even properly name the book of the Bible from which it derived its title, was shot in less than a week in order to help the Weinstein Company keep the rights to the franchise in hopes that a big-budget remake was on the horizon. Not even Doug Bradley, famed as THE actor behind the lead Cenobite Pinhead, returned to the film, a first for the series, and he was replaced by Stephen Smith Collins, who looks like he might work for the role until you see him in the incredibly off-putting makeup, which made him look, well, kinda chubby. While most of the films on this list are certified classics disowned by their authors due to creative integrity, it seems like Clive Barker just saw an obvious crappy cash grab and gave it a big ol' nope. Finally, we come to Myra Breckenridge, one of the great movie bombs of the 1970s. Breckenridge. The film follows a man, played by film critic Rex Reed for some reason, who has a sex change and turns into Raquel Welch, and goes on a series of, uh, let, let's say, misadventures. All leading to a twist ending that feels at once disappointing and insulting. All of this is made all the more bizarre by a totally stacked cast featuring legends like Farrah Fawcett, John Huston, John Carradine, and Mae West, who came out of retirement to do... this. While Myra Breckenridge does maintain a small cult following, it's also been widely considered one of the worst films ever made. Vidal claimed to have never actually watched this adaptation of his 1968 novel, but was quoted as saying, The film was so bad that the book stopped selling for a decade. Ouch. Bad adaptations are one thing, but don't mess with Gore's pocketbook. That's all for now, Screen Ranters. Have your own opinions on these adaptations? Feel like we missed some prime author hatred? Write in your version below, and don't forget to subscribe to Screen Rant for more artist-on-artist badmouthing.